tonight we have a very important conversation for the cross-country dialogue with youth on women and politics in the Caribbean. Tonight we're joined by Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade in the Government of Jamaica, and also by Roshana Trim, the, the Project Manager of Pink Parliament right here in Barbados. Um, this conversation is really supposed to be a really engaging conversation between the youth in Barbados and the wider Caribbean about um, women participating in politics, women who uh, have become ministers in government and to talk about their experiences and to share with pink parliamentarians and other youth, youth in Barbados and the wider Caribbean about um, their experiences as well as challenges and also we are hoping that we can also have a very fruitful discussion that will help us in our goals to narrow the political ambition gap of women entering the political arena. And for those who are just joining, you can join us on YouTube at the UA Open Campuses link, as well as on Twitter. And you can also ask your questions and make your comments there as well. I'm not going to take very long, but I just wanted to say that we're very, very happy to see you all. And we're very happy to have the minister this evening to have this conversation with us. And I'm going to hand over immediately to Ms. Roshana Trim from Pink Parliament. Thank you so much. Roshana, can you unmute, please? Oh, sorry. Hi, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith this afternoon, as well as extend gratitude on behalf of Pink Parliament um, to the Women and Development Unit here in Barbados for partnering with us um, to bring these dialogues. Like Tai Tu mentioned, my name is Roshana Trim. I am the project manager for Pink Parliament. And just before I introduce you to the senator and invite her to speak about her experience as a woman in politics, I do want to share a bit about what Pink Parliament is and what we aim to do at Pink Parliament. Um, Pink Parliament is an initiative that was founded in 2019. We actually began on International Day of the Girl Child. And the project aims to engage young women ages 14 to 20 in um, building a network and exploring and understanding not only feminism but how women can become involved in politics what are the barriers that may hinder us but also what are the opportunities for countries like the caribbean and other countries around the world as it relates to um, providing more representation more women as representatives in politics and we continuously through education empowerment and engagement with women in politics, senators, members of parliament, diplomats, and other persons who lead, women who lead. Um, we seek to allow for our girls to understand the importance of taking up space and how to do so unapologetically. And so tonight it is only fitting that um, I introduce a woman who leads very unapologetically. Um, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson Smith has been an attorney at law for 20 years, having worked in both the private practice and as corporate in house counsel. On the 7th of September 2020, Senator Kamina Johnson Smith was reappointed as the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade of Jamaica following the successful outcome of her party's re election at the September 3rd polls, in which she played a pivotal role as campaign for. Person. Minister Johnson Smith has committed to the building of the foundations laid in her first term, which commenced on the 7th of March 2016. At that time, Jamaica's first female Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, as well as the first reborn after her country's independence, was concurrently appointed Leader of Government Business in the Senate and Chair of various Senate committees in 2016. She has similarly been reappointed to these posts. As Jamaica's foreign minister, Senator Johnson Smith has represented her country at numerous bilateral, regional, and hemispheric and international fora in Africa, the Americas, Asia, the Caribbean, and Europe. 
she has reaffirmed Jamaica's commitment to multilateralism and a principle-based foreign policy, ensuring that at all times it is aligned with Jamaica's national development goals and the country's roles as a good global citizen. Senator Johnson-Smith has a keen interest in governance, education, youth, and gender affairs, and has successfully tabled parliamentary motions regarding public sector governance, reintegration of teen mothers into the formal school system, and the review of laws related to violence against women, children, the elderly, and persons living with disabilities. In her last term as leader of government business in the Senate, she also presided over numerous debates and passage of statutes. Senator Johnson Smith holds a Master's of Law in Commercial Law from the London School of Economics and Political Science, a Bachelor of Laws from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, and a Bachelor of Art in French from the University of West Indies, Mona. She is a graduate of the Norman Manley Law School, where she was valedictorian and the recipient of awards in legal remedies and advocacy and represented the school as lead advocate in mooting competitions in Trinidad and Tobago and Malaysia. She is highly committed to public service and volunteerism and has served various philanthropic organizations in, in different capacities. She has also served on the Corporate Governance Committee of the Public Sector Organization of Jamaica for six years and as director of the Factories Corporation of Jamaica and the Early Childhood Commission. Minister Johnson Smith was born in St. Andrew, Jamaica and is married. The minister believes passionately that Jamaica's best days still lie ahead and is committed to playing her part in seeing them realized. Um, I want to thank once again, thank the Senator for joining us tonight. And I definitely do invite the pink parliamentarians as well as everyone who has tuned in this afternoon to listen attentively, but to also engage fruitfully um, once we start the question and answer. So without any further ado, Senator, the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith. Thank you so much, uh, Roshana, and thank you very much for, for your kind introduction. And thank you also to uh, Taitu for inviting me. I uh, want to congratulate you both on the work that you're doing, uh, Roshana, in the Pink Parliament concept. And I just, I love the term. <laughs> I love the, you know, Pink Parliament conjures up all sorts of great images. and. Um, and I, I want to congratulate you on the work that you're doing. Uh, Taitu, same to you as well at UA, always uh, ensuring that the gender agenda is high uh, and at the forefront of, um, of the minds of academia and international organizations. And um, I really encourage you all and your teams in the work of engaging young women in, um, in preparing themselves for careers in politics and in, in leadership. Uh, I have to say that I, I, I maybe not the, maybe not the most, I'm not the best candidate I would say for the conversation because I never planned to be in politics. I didn't plan to be a politician. And um, even up to the point in time when I was you know, asked to join the Senate, um, asked to serve. I had not anticipated or laid out a plan to be, uh, to serve in that capacity. And, um, and I, I make that point to say that I think that young ladies, young women who are a part of programs like this will be far better prepared than I ever was and are far more likely to succeed than uh, many young women or many women in my generation have uh, because they're having the opportunity to have their minds opened uh, to think uh, more critically about their paths in terms of leadership and political leadership because it is quite distinct, I think, from, uh, from other types of service. Um, so, just to share, I had been asked to share a bit about, you know, well, how did I get into politics? And um, the, the, the fact is that how I started in active politics was that a colleague of mine who got a scholarship to, um, 
to study overseas, happened to be the legal advisor for the young professional arm of the political party of which I am a member and asked me as a young attorney and a young attorney whose father was in politics, um, whether I would hold that position because I had bona fides, if we would call it that, from a political perspective in that I'd be trusted, um, but they really just needed someone who was a reasonable attorney to hold the space while he was gone and, um, and asked if I would do so. I interviewed with the council, with the executive committee and, um, and got it and, and, and I was asked to join. And from there, strangely enough, <laughs> <laughs> I got very involved. I became head cook and bottle washer, started a blood drive, um, finished their constitution, which allowed the organization to become a formal part of the political party. Uh, from there, I was asked to represent the organization at the party level on one of its uh, most senior committees. And from there was then elected to serve on its highest operational committee and from there, asked to join dispute resolution, legal, constitutional, um, communications, and several others based on just uh, sort of doing work. Really, I was always the person who would be happy to pick up the time and do drafting or to make a proposal as to how a matter could be approached, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, therefore sort of became uh, someone you could rely on to do work. And uh, in that context, because I've, I mean, people would always ask uh, my father and I, you know, years on, you know, how, how, how did um, he get me into politics? And we would be like, um, <laughs> that's not really how it happened. It really had absolutely nothing to do, save that uh, his, um, his activity, political activity did, uh, was a was an opening, you know, uh, but that it was really uh, based on work that I had started to do at a, a junior level in the organization that had happened to get me noticed and um, and active at a higher level. And it was one of the things that I used to be uh, really quite. Um, I used to worry about people thinking that I was a coattail girl you know, that I was riding on the coats of my father, as opposed to a young professional woman who was hardworking, doing her best and serving an organization which itself was committed to serving Jamaica. And um, uh, it was, maybe I'll say a little more about that if, 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 if it comes up again, but it, it was really quite a, um, quite a process for me to recognize that, uh, there's a point at which you acknowledge and, um, and, and welcome goodwill that you might get from any, uh, whether family or any networking um, relationship that you might have, but that uh, there's really just no, no replacement for hard work. There's a reason they say that, you know, success is where opportunity meets preparation, because that's actually quite true. Um, you there's really no replacement for discipline for being the person who does the work who gets it done who knows what she's talking about who has done her research and is recognized in that way um i think politics for a young woman especially in a space where um, which is dominated by men um, and by older men uh, i think for me it was very important uh, to carve out that this was a working professional space and um, to make sure, and it was important to me personally, maybe not important to everyone, but that I was seen in that context. And, um, and that was actually quite, a, quite an uphill battle in terms of proving myself. And uh, even when I didn't realize that that was what I was doing, that in reflection, I can see that that was, that was the path. Um, so, I mean, one of the, the points that I always say to young women is know your stuff, have your data, you know, have your, if, if, if you're, um, if you're speaking on, on a, on a matter 
that should be informed not only by your opinions or your feelings, do your research, uh, be prepared to answer questions, think matters through so that you are, um, you're able to give informed views and be recognized for uh, that you rather are not vulnerable uh, to maybe suggestions that you're either speaking from emotion or um, so, or, or with a, a particular agenda in mind, I've always found that I've always been able to change a conversation by having the data. And um, so people who want to take you down different paths, y y things you can't argue with are numbers and data and research. So I always encourage young women um, who want to lead in any, in any area, do your work. There's really no, no replacement for it, um, no substitute. If you are someone, as a matter of fact, who needs to speak uh, from notes, prepare yourself and carry a note. Don't be concerned if people around you are speaking extempore and, um, and you have your notes. If that's how you do best, then you do you. You know, Carry your notes if that's what you need. Um, it may well be that you change your, your um, comfort level later on, uh, but you should really work with they have, um, with methods that work for you. Um, I would also say to young women who want to get into politics or who are interested in it, don't do politics for politics sake, meaning politics is not a career, uh, in my opinion. It's a process that allows you to do. Uh, so it is the process by which you can do the most good for the largest number of people at any single time. That's politics. Um, it's service at the highest level. And it is quite often, if not always, thankless. So it's not something that you should do for the power. It's not something that you should do for what you may perceive as glamour. Um, because whatever you may see in terms of a photo or two, you are absolutely not seeing what goes behind that, what goes into the work to, to, for this moment. Um, I'm always really, really um, emphatic on the point that, you know, people, even in foreign affairs, they will look at the photo that you have of the handshake, the photo that you may have of the toast at an event, the photo that they may have that you may have, you know, delivering a speech, and it may all in some, you know, uh, exotic location or the other, but the you really don't see all of the work that goes into having a conversation about the nuances of a country, uh, which to which you have never traveled before, uh, meeting. Uh, how many people that you have never met before, but with whom you need to create a relationship immediately in order to achieve a particular result for your country. And this must be done effortlessly, and it must be done seamlessly, and it must be done in a context where there are a thousand other moving parts that um, you know could collide at any point in time. Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of preparation, and um, it doesn't... Uh, as a sorry, I'm not sure if you're being disturbed by a buzzing of my phone, but um, right. So it takes a lot out of you. Um, service, um, that's foreign affairs, but service, whether as an MP or as, as a senator, if you're going to do it right, it, it does take, and I know I've said this word a um, lot, but I'll say it again because it's work. <laughs> that's, that's really what service is about working in the interest of delivering a difference um, to your people, to your country, to your region. And um, I think uh, where politics becomes about the power as opposed to, to the authority to create change and where it becomes about ego as opposed to the confidence to take action and to, and to deliver um, that's kind of the space in which things go wrong. That's the space where maybe um, you don't accomplish what you could and what you will. Um, I think I would also uh, a point which which I, I 
think it's always important to share because it's one of the things I learned fairly late, um, fairly late in life, um, uh, or rather in political activity. Uh, I went to a conference on population and development, and uh, in it, uh, in this was uh, a few years ago. Clearly, um, I was in. Well, it's a bit of a blur, <laughs> to be honest. The last several years have been a bit of a blur, but I went to a seminar on a woman in leadership, and uh, one of the the. Uh, phrases that was shared and that has always stuck with me is this concept of the power of the pen that if you want to make change if you want to change laws if you want to change the laws in your country the most effective way to do it is to have the power of the pen the conversation was about you know um women not running for leadership, not seeking to be in parliament and uh, not seeing the need for it. And the point was, that is the space. If you want to change a law yourself, there's only one place you can do it, and that is in the parliament of your country. So whenever to this day, I get distressed or demotivated by the whole process and the challenges, you know, um, the that you, that you encounter every day you know this is not an easy space to operate in in terms of the world in which we live to put it as high as that um i remind myself that why i'm here is the power of the pen so um change may not happen at the pace that you want it to it may not happen at the pace um that you even try to make it happen um i i i one of the things that I'm passionate about, you, you read in my um, introduction, uh, Roshana, about my interest in women and children and uh, protecting um, vulnerable communities. And one of the things that I did in, in 2013, I moved a motion for a review of four pieces of legislation that affect, um, that treat with violence against women, children, elderly, persons with disabilities, um, seeking to have stronger penalties, um, you know, a review on, on the penalties for murder of pregnant women and, and some other uh, specific matters. And it took almost a year for that motion to be taken and debated. And then it took about another year or so for the Joint Select Committee to be established. And then it was moving its way along and then there was an election and then we had to wait for another joint select committee to be established and it took another three years for that joint select committee to go through the work. I mean, admittedly, the, the work was heavy. We had and we had a lot of public consultations. A lot of submissions were made and things beyond what the committee originally contemplated were brought in. But um, it's only in 2019, December 2019, that the report was finalized and sent to the technical committees for the actual amendments to be done, which are being worked on now. And um, I have to say that until those laws are changed, <laughs> you know, I will not, even though everything in it is not what my, what the vision was, um, some of the changes are so important that, um, I will not feel like the job has been done until those four laws, that those amendment laws are passed. And so, of course, Domestic Violence Act, Child Care and Protection Act, Offenses Against the Persons Act, and the Sexual Offenses Act. And it deal, they all together deal with a whole gamut of offenses um, that need amendment uh, to better protect the individuals that they're intended to. But again, that's about the power of the pen. And I remind myself about that. And I say that, that, you know, so you can choose advocacy, which is what you would do otherwise and what many persons do, or you can choose to be in the space where you actually hold the pen and hold the laws. Neither space is an easy one to, um, to exist in, but I remind myself about why I am here.
And I, um, so if anybody needs a, a motivation about pushing through, I remind you that that's the goal, to get that pen and to have that power, to make change, not power for power's sake. Um, so uh, there's, there's really a lot that I could share. I mean, there's a whole pool of experiences and, you know, teaching moments. <laughs> But but I think rather than just sort of talking, um, I, I'm not sure if, if I've reached the 15 minute that you recommended, but I think that it would be great to open to questions and um, and engagement if you're if you're OK with that. Um, if we don't have any questions, then maybe the moderators could ask me to take on a particular issue or to share a particular type of experience. I'd be happy to. Awesome. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, it was really great to hear about your experiences and definitely the power of the pen. Um, for those of you who are currently in our call, um, feel free to raise your hands and let us know that you have a question. Um, for those of you who are watching via Instagram, YouTube, or um, Facebook, you can also type your question um, and we'll ask that question from our end. Um, but while everyone gets a chance probably to pull their thoughts together, one of the things that I do want to ask is that you mentioned um, that there were challenges sometimes and you had to remind yourself of why you were doing what you were doing. And so you went back to the power of the pen. Can you share what some of your challenges have been and do you um, view those challenges as being um, based more so by women? Um, and, and how do you overcome those challenges? Well, <laughs> my, my most effective strategy is to not think about it and just power through. <laughs> I mean, it may sound, may sound very basic, uh, but uh, in, in terms of getting the work done, literally working through my philosophy, um, and I, Again, this may be why I'm not the best candidate for this thing. Very basic chick, very basic girl. Um, right foot in front of left. Really literally, sometimes you just have to hold yourself together and just, I'm moving in this direction. I'm going to get it done. And it is, um, I think sometimes if you, if, if you focus too heavily on the challenge, you can get lost in the challenge itself and uh, the share the magnitude of pressure can subsume you so it's important to be able to break out your work in terms of what you're trying to achieve what is your goal what's your focus um, not necessarily in terms of your broad you know existential why are we here? Why am I here? It's not always going to come down to the power of the pen, but literally, this is a terrible situation. How do I get through? Sometimes you literally really just have to pause and center yourself and think about and actually break down what you are trying to achieve and how to get there. Is there another way? Is there someone who can support me in this? Do I need to reach out? Um, is there a strategy that I should be pursuing that I'm not? Um, what have, what, what um, have I been, what, what has gotten me into this space? So what do I, do I need to rethink how I'm approaching this? And, um, and then to really just sort of uh, focus on the steps to get you back to your goal. Um, I think if I were to start to talk about my challenges, we'd be here a whole lot longer than the time you have planned. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you've watched the news recently, <laughs> but <laughs> we I, I I do recall uh, being approached in an informal setting by a former foreign minister of Jamaica who was like, um, girl, I will not lie, I would not want to be foreign minister now. <laughs> this was a couple of years ago, but uh, I remember saying to him, you know, it, it, it's um, there's a lot of walking through the raindrops and a lot of um, 
a lot of uh, managing and balancing, but it is the work. So right foot in front of left. Simple philosophy, once you're heading forward, um, you're going in the right direction. Let me ask a question here while others get ready. I wanted to find out if, um, for instance, if we use the example of the motions that you're trying to push through Parliament at the time, do you find that um, sometimes when the issues relate more to women that the motions may take a little longer to go through or, or is it relating to other issues that other, we, may, we, we may not be aware of? Sorry, go, go again, Taitu. You're say, I yeah, I wanted to find out if the, the motions that you're trying to push through Parliament to, to amend the legislations that related to women and children and persons with disabilities and the elderly, if you found that sometimes those kinds of mo motions may have moved slower or were not given as much priority because of who they were representing or are there other issues that um, may have affected the, the process of getting to the amendment stages? I think both. I think that, um, that, there, that there are some, some, there has been some deprioritization at some stages, meaning you're, there's a practical side of really working for committee time because that was the difficulty at the first step that we're not going to set up the committee because there are too many committees and there's no committee time. And then when the committee was established, then it became about the issues. Uh, but part of it, because I wouldn't want to overstate it, um, I, 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 you know, I like to try not to get caught in a narrative uh, because it's convenient. I try to, you know, remain uh, clear that there there, there's a lot of a lot of issues that um, that needed discussion, and there were a lot of differing views on how they should be treated. Some were very controversial and took a lot of time, and others um, took a lot of discussion because of the legal complexities that may not have been perceived. So there, I, I definitely will recognize that there was a lot of complex and heavy work that had to be done. Uh, but I do think that there, um, there was an element of deprioritization at, at, at least at different points that impacted on the length of time. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Emerald. Would you, Emerald, do you wish to unmute your mic and go ahead, please? Hey, good night. My question is, do you believe that having women in political leadership provides different kinds of voices and why or why not? Absolutely, um, it, it can, it has the potential to, uh, but I think uh, Emerald, and thank you for your question, by the way, uh, and cool haircut, apart from the color, I think we have the same one. Uh, <laughs> they, I think that the, uh, it's been said, so it's nothing new or profound, but uh, all women are not feminists. Uh, all women don't see things the same way. And, um, and that they're, you're therefore not guaranteed a difference uh, because there is a woman's voice at the table. Uh, that being said, I do believe that we, many of us bring a different voice and bring a different perspective and that uh, the more of us that are in a space having experiences uh, that are similar, if not shared, and uh, that uh, allow us to focus on different things or, or bring them to the table in different ways, that the more that that happens is the more that conversations change and can be changed. And I think that's extremely important to leadership and it's extremely important to the development of our countries. So thank you very much for that question. I hope that helps. Um, thank you, Senator. One of the questions I wanted to ask um, ties back to Taito's question about the policy and the ability to promote policy that um, centers on some things that might not be prioritized. 
um, one of the things that I, I noticed within recently, a few years back, um, there was a very strong discussion in Jamaica about marital rape. And um, I believe that that was one of the things that then became illegal at that point in time. Um, in your judgment, what are some of the key policies that you believe, not only in Jamaica, but across the region, that we should address in order to really start to address or attack um, violence against women and children? No, that needs its whole session. <laughs> it, needs a, it needs an entire session. That is really <laughs> impossible to answer uh, just so. What I, what I can say in respect of marital rape, um, it became a statutory offense in 2009 when the Sexual Offenses Act was passed. And the difficulty with the offense is that it required conditions to be met, including that you had to be separated, the, the couple had to be separated, and uh, there had to be some sort of agreement that they that they were that they were separated, and uh, also what's this? It's something like three three conditions. I can't even remember them now. But the beauty is that the the Joint Select Committee has accepted and recommended to the Parliament that all the conditions be removed, and um, that was a very difficult discussion in the first. Uh, Joint Select Committee, the issue was actually totally, um, uh, it, it became the subject of uh, levity and, you know, people were saying, you know, well, are, are you going to now end up with husband and wife have to sign documents as to when they can have sex or when they're not. And, um, you know, uh, the, the entire view that a, a woman and a man were married and a man woman must obey her husband's command that, you know, and I think that in this second round, uh, we managed to be able to, cha to change the conversation. And, and again, this is why women's voices are so different, are so important at the table on matters like this. Um, we were able to change the conversation to one about, especially the, the Christian conversation, which was about the sanctity of marriage. And that what we were seeking to do was to, uh, to uh, undermine the sanctity of marriage was to turn it around and say, you are seeking to ensure that a woman who is married has less rights to her body than a woman who is not. And if you are seeking to elevate the sanctity of marriage and you are seeking to elevate the, um, the concept of marriage or encourage marriage as a cornerstone of society, then you are undermining that uh, by saying that a woman who undertakes this act is somehow uh, has less less autonomy, less right to her body, and um, it it actually did change the conversation and uh, made it very difficult to say uh, otherwise. So sometimes we really have to again, it's why women's voices are so important, and um, and also uh, was another situation in which you can recognize that all women don't think the same because of course there were. Um, women who had, uh, you know, a, a, a fundamental view or a fundamentalist view of of what happened to their rights when they got married, and um, so it, it's really quite challenging. But again, issues which um, which uh, disincentivize, let us call it that, um, uh, offenses against women, offenses against children, and that are. Um, take data-driven approaches to recognize that we, um, that violence underpinning violence against women is an inhibitor to empowerment. So it's not something that needs to be dealt with separately. So the fact that you're achieving economic empowerment does not mean that you, do, that you don't have to deal with violence against women. As a policy, it actually is as important. And, um, you know, I say to people that you have to turn the page. When you look at the page and you see, all the wonderful accomplishments, for example, that we have in Jamaica, for example, with um, you know the number of women at, in leadership positions in the public service and um, you know in the judiciary, uh, legal profession, etc. That you still have to uh, turn the page and look at the fact that we also have um, a, a, a significant level of, of abuse of domestic violence. Uh, the incidence of sexual abuse against girl children, 
much higher than that of boys. These are things that numbers show, they're quite clear, and that therefore you need to, you need to address that as well as it is also an inhibitor and a disempowering um, policy matter, policy issue. Thank you so much for that answer. Let me see, there's a question, hold on. I'm gonna ask, there's a question here that um, you were involved in managing campaigns, but yet you're ent you, you, you're, you have not entered representational politics. Could you explain, um, is it a preference? You know, could you give, elaborate some more on that? those two roles that you have played in some sense that you you have managed political campaigns or party campaigns for other candidates but you yourself didn't choose to go that route if that's what i understood so, how it was so, yeah right so i um i actually haven't managed campaigns for individuals um i have been a campaign spokesperson i have um been um manifesto chair this year i've been before the sort of worked on the manifesto in the the time um in previous elections as well i'm always there and um i i think that there are different roles in politics and this is a, a question that i have to answer all the time because people are always asking me why don't you run um so I think it's important to also have people who focus on the legislation and at and in the in representational politics, um, you are your your legislative role because of the Westminster system, you're um, you're very much split between the uh, the actual the people part of managing a constituency and dealing with um, bread and butter issues, which are absolutely important and a very important part of politics. But there's also the role for focusing on how do we make this law better? Um, what's an issue here that's not being addressed? Um, why does this say and instead of or? You, you'd actually be surprised that there are far less of those persons that you would think exist <laughs> when you consider the size of our legislatures. Um, but this is something that I, um, I'll say I've not been bad at. And um, this is my fourth ter term being appointed as a Senate. Uh, and um, therefore there, I think it's a valuable role to play as well. It may not be as valued, as highly valued as representational politics, but it's important to recognize that every role in politics is important. And I tell people whether it is you are an indoor agent, an outdoor agent, you are a runner who looks for votes, you're somebody who drafts policies, somebody who suggests an idea, somebody who's making sure that food is served on election day, somebody who is cooking the food, somebody who is, um, you know, serving in the Senate or who's serving otherwise. Politics requires lots of parts to work well. And um, I, I just have not gone down that path chose another one. So before we ask, before I ask the next question that we have, um, would you consider um, elective politics or are you extremely comfortable as it relates to just crafting legislation, assisting on the campaign as it relates to the manifesto drafting and those different things? You know, I'm allowing myself a little chuckle at the, the fact that you said that, or are you comfortable just drafting legislation? <laughs> And I know you didn't mean to say it in that way, but it's actually the subconscious um, value system that we've placed on representational politics. Um, so it, it, for me, it's not just a function of comfort. It is uh, a thing that I think is important and, um, and one which I am I'm committed to pursuing in this role. I never say never in life because that's why they, there's a reason they say never say never. But um, but it is not on my list of things to do. Thank you, um, Ronald. Um, you have a question, Ronald King. I 
hello, good night. Um, I had a question. Arnell, can you turn on your camera if you don't mind, if it's okay? Is that possible? I can't. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I had a question as to what are <coughs> oh, that's why I had off my stuff. Sorry, children in the background. A friendly environment, don't worry. <laughs> um, so basically, my question was, what are your views on the issue of abortion rights in Jamaica? And do you believe that the increased participation of women in politics could help to turn the tide resulting in its legalization? Can, sorry, what's the, fa the last part of your sentence just before um, resulting in its legalization? Turning it. Do you believe the increased increase? Um, okay, right, sorry. The increased participation of women in politics, if it could help to turn the tide, resulting in its legalization. Right. It could, but it also might not. And this ties back to the point that I made before that it's not, it, it, every woman does not believe in abortion rights. Um, I, I think that it is um, what we would, like to believe is that more women are more likely to have a broader perspective on the issue. Um, but I think that it is important for us to also um, develop allies. Uh, when I was speaking earlier in answer to Roshana's uh, question about how do you deal with challenges, one of the things that I mentioned, one of the strategies was that you have to look at um, at what's, what's your strategy as well, you know? Do I need support on this from a broader constituency than that which I currently have? Um, there are men who could assist in being powerful voices. Uh, is it a function of having more support in the public domain that creates the, po the political drive for action to be taken? Uh, because clearly, it is not, um, I think it would be a truism to say that politicians respond to voters, they respond to votes. So if it is that you are seeking to press for something and you are showing, telling you, you have a sufficient um, uh, or you develop sufficient movement behind an issue, whether it is abortion or any other issue, um, to indicate to your member of parliament that this is an issue that could cost you this seat, or this is an issue, you know, there, there are enough of us women voters or enough of us voters, male and female, who believe in this issue and believe that it needs to change. And that is, um, you know, developing a, a push for action to be taken is also another way. So yes, getting more women in politics should help us with issues like this, uh, but broader having, um, having a broader, uh, let us say, uh, collaboration or collaborative approach uh, that ensures that you have people in different spaces to take the issue for you um, is important as well. Even trying to get people in the church to have religious voices who speak on the fact of safety because there are between denominations, uh, different beliefs as well. Um, so I think that it's important to not only look at one way forward, more women to me is not a magical, a magic wand um, because at, we do need a political um, motivation, I think sometimes on issues. And part of that is strategy. Part of that is advocacy. Part of that is co-option of allies uh, who will work with you to get things done. And um, I think if you're too focused on one strategy as being your answer, uh, you are less likely to succeed with it. So I think the broadest base that's possible because the broadest base is what will um, create the political momentum is actually the best way to seek change especially on controversial issues. Thank you. Um, so I have, I have a quick question. Um, well, maybe not a quick question, but I do have a question. And my question um, focuses on 
you mentioned before and very truthfully that every woman is not a feminist. Definitely not. Um, and every woman doesn't necessarily, and women aren't a homogeneous group, so every woman doesn't have the same wants or needs or desires. Um, what works for a woman who is upper class may not be the desires of a woman who is lower class. Um, the career woman and the entrepreneur may have different wants, or they may be the same. And so my question is, how do we engage women or engage each other? Because sometimes because of how different our views are, um, we often fall apart in creating the collaborative effort or finding common ground as women on which to rally around or to support. So how do we begin to engage and continue to engage women who may not necessarily have the same views as us or who don't necessarily have the same desires as us, particularly when it may be something that may be beneficial to women. So for example, um, the idea of my body, my choice, you may never have that challenge in your life, or you may come at, it, it may come a time where it becomes a lot more tangible or real to you because you now have to make the decision, but you find yourself blocked because you can't. Um, so yeah, a long, long way to say something very simple about how do we open doors and start to have conversations that promote um, the empowerment of women and access to various things, even if we don't necessarily agree on the method or the end goal at the point in time. I think that might be the $64 million question. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, we, we all need to, be more open, essentially. Um, open to listening, um, not just hearing, but actually listening and understanding that while there are differences, there are commonalities, there are shared interests as well. And being open to recognizing that even where your direct interests do not lie, that a broader interest may exist. And sometimes, sometimes the challenge is about the conversation to have in a particular space or with a particular woman or group of women uh, because different issues appeal differently. And um, I think if you try to have the same conversation with a lot of different people or whether they be men or women, um, you will have different results. And if we continue to try to have the same conversation then we will continue to have that same result. So I think it's very important. And I know I've used this word before, I'll use it again, but strategy. These, um, these things are not magic and they're not, while they are emotive, they are not all emotionally led and your strategy can't always be emotionally led. You really have to have the ability to just sit down and say, how are we going to get this done? This is church group A because churches are all not the same either. And we, uh, we have an opportunity to engage. Um, how is it that they understand this issue? Because you, in, in order to, to communicate in a way that's effective, you need to understand the perspective of the party to whom you are communicating or with whom you are communicating. How do they think about this issue? How then can I frame my argument to have them at least understand my perspective so that there is a shared understanding, even if there's not agreement. Um, it, it's very important to then say, okay, well, all right, that is that conversation, but that conversation may not make sense to have with group B, which is, um, let us say, women, bankers or lawyers, which is an even more diverse set because they may all have 10,000 different perspectives as well. And I say that um, disclosing interest. <laughs> um, you have to really think about, you have to, you have to think about your strategies. And, um, you know, they have a process that, uh, I'm sure, you know, Taitu is probably much more knowledgeable about this, but about, you know, identifying your circles of influence, 
when you're when you're um, undertaking advocacy. So who who are the people who have the conversations with these people? If you can't get to the person with a different perspective, how can you have a conversation with someone who has that convers who has the opportunity to have that conversation? You have to identify um, not only what kind of conversation to have, which is based on understanding, because this, these things take work. They take deep thinking, how to change a conversation, how to change a mindset, and if not to change it, how to engage in an understanding conversation that sees that can then move into, okay, we're actually not as far apart as I thought we were. How can we close this gap? And that is, I mean, you, you asked it in a, in a specific context, but it is, um, I'm sharing with you a general approach because it's applicable to different things, including controversial issues like um, abortion. So one person may be open to having a conversation. First of all, there may be people who are not open to having the conversation and you may need to recognize that. And, one, and, and seeking to have the conversation when someone is close to you not a good strategy and only going to frustrate both of you. Um, but finding someone that may have a, a different conversation with that person may be a possibility and you should think about that. Or whether your energy should be focused here at all. Next person, how do I have the, this different conversation? What do they want to hear? And again, understanding how do we close the gap? I think it's very important to, um, to recognize that it's um, in many of these things, we have to move away from our, uh, uh, not move away from. So you're inspired by the passion, you're inspired by the emotion, but you have to think through in a very cerebral way, how do we get this done? What message? Is this somebody who responds to numbers? Is this somebody who responds to visuals? You know, do I need to go there with some graphics? Is this somebody who, um, you know, responds to, um to pressure in which case what i need to do is speak to people who will apply that pressure so you really do have to think about how um how to change that conversation how to identify a commonality and how to um and where you're wasting your time is also a very important thing to recognize and know so that you can use the energy more effectively elsewhere i hope that thank helps. you so much um Thank you. That was a really thorough answer. And definitely, I think, um, for the pink part of my interior is very important, even within just advocacy and, and being able to, to speak about the things that you want. Because oftentimes we are very passionate about something, but we don't reach our target because we don't find the common ground or we don't create a message or craft our message in a way that they're open to receiving. Um, I do know that Roshana Jones had a question. Um, Roshana? Hello, good evening. I just wanted to know, do you believe um, quotas like reserve seats that we see in parts of Africa or legislated um, quotas like we see in um, Guyana will be effective in the Caribbean and in Jamaica to increase the participation of women in politics? Thanks for that, Roshana. Um, I, well, what I, what I will start with is a celebratory note that in Jamaica, we have the highest number of parliamentarians that we have had historically. Um, so that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the process continues. Uh, we, we continue to work at, at, how, um, at how to increase that, that figure. Um, we have the most in both houses and then cumulatively. Um, so in most countries that have uh, quotas, uh, they have a proportional representation system. So they don't have um, a first past the post system. I think only Tanzania has, I think Tanzania is the only first past the post. Uh, my, my research could be dated, but I it used to be that Tanzania was the only country that had first past the post and quotas. Um, they are possible through lists, through party lists, um, so that you, you don't have um, the quota on the, uh, on the electoral side or the elective side. You have it on the internal party administrative side. So your party sets its own target in terms of, um, of recruitment. Uh, but I, um, I personally 
have not necessarily uh, been convinced that they are the best way. And um, I know that there are people who feel very passionately about it on both sides. Um, but I think that uh, my question has been, and I've, I've actually said before, this might be a good place to raise it in. Um, has anybody done a study in the Caribbean in particular, um, and at UWE in particular, um, why more women do not, um, do not run for election? We serve in every capacity everywhere. We're all over, we're in the legal service at the higher level, highest level, we're in the judiciary, we're in the public service, we're in, you know, we're the permanent secretaries, we are the auditor generals, we are the, um, I mean, you name it, we're there. In the churches, we are at the leadership of all of the committees and councils, and we are at, um, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, starting our own companies, we're, you know, leading, re we're leading banks. Um, and yet, somehow, although there are no legislative barriers, uh, we're not leading in politics. We're not leading as much as we should. We're not running. Um, in Jamaica, we just had, I think we had, uh, we have 18 women who won. Um, my party had 18 candidates and their female candidates and there were 12 female candidates uh, run in by the opposition. Um, 18 overall won. Um, I don't think, which is a, not a bad percentage in terms of uh, electoral results among women. Um, I'm, I don't think that we are still at the stage where uh, where our citizens do not see women as leaders, that our citizens will not vote for a woman over a man. I think we have actually passed that, um, or we're passing it, but we, we absolutely need more women running. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of the challenge, and we've, we've, I know there are some great programs, such as, clearly, Pick Parliament, <laughs> which encourage women, encourage young women to think about how they um about themselves as leaders to see themselves as leaders to stop running in the student council for pr and and secretary um which are both important roles and vice but to run for president mm -hmm. to run for the head to, run, to, to actually lead the organization um to run for president of the guild to run uh, um you know to to see yourself as the head of the organization and not uh, only at the supporting level. Because while supporting is important, I often say, if you're gonna have to do all the work, you might as well have all the authority with it. Why not? Yeah. Um, and I think I've encouraged a few people to take a, a couple leaps based on that alone. You're doing the work. So if you're doing mm -hmm. the work, why not, why not be, the, be the actual head? Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, why not? You know, but there is a, you know, we're, we're very hard on ourselves. We're, we're the first people to say we're not qualified, first people to say we're not ready, first people to question whether this is the right time. Um, unlike men who, you know, the testosterone tends to cloud, all sorts of stuff, <laughs> um, important stuff, <laughs> but it also seems to cloud that, um, that doubt factor. You know, um, we're, we're really too prone to self-doubt. And I think if we, if we uh, conquer that uh, and run more, I think we're at a stage where uh, our populaces, our people are seeing powerful women as leaders succeeding, successfully leading countries, uh, leading ministries, uh, leading uh, enterprises, that I think that, you know, we're at that time. So quotas are one way. Um, but I think to focus on quotas rather than focusing on raising participation as, as your actual goal and however you get there. So, you, you know, you need, you're targeting at the secondary school level in your students' councils, you're targeting at your tertiary organizations uh, in terms of your guild and other representative bodies. And you're, um, and you're also targeting, you know, your, your broad base of women to say, you know, uh, you know, if you're, you're, you're a fantastic um, pastor, 
you know, why not keep your, take your, uh, your convening powers into a political space where you can uh, reach an even larger flock? You know, how, how can we get more women into this space? Is, is, um, is, a, is a question, and I think there's more than one path. Nice. Um, so I just, one of the things I wanted, because we spent a lot of time um, engaging women in politics. Uh, we spoke to persons like in Bailey Miller in Barbados, um, and different senators as well as other ministers, and oftentimes the question is always about women participation because our program is very specifically geared to increasing women's participation in politics and once again the question about why women don't venture into politics when definitely we've come a long way in society with women as leaders and as representatives and some things come out um i did a course with um, um professor C um, cynthia barrow at university when i was doing international relations and one of the things that one of the quotes that specifically research would be that the way how we do gender is really wrong and so women are socialized in a specific way and we have to kind of alert and learn that as we grow but then also in a broader society there's a level of socialization that we have so for example one of the things that people always ask would be um or do you have children are you married um you can't have it or all so do you balance your career and and being a being a politician and having a family um studies show that women are scrutinized differently in politics so we scrutinize women on a lot of different things like how they dress the way they wear their hair um and all of those different things um and they're discouraged because they feel as if you your life is kind of put under a microscope as opposed to your male counterpart but also, and I'm, I'm going to close here, I saw some comments coming into chat. Um, but one of the other things that we'll see as well is that being a woman and it's easy to be dismissed. Um, you're seen as if you are too, if you're too passionate, if, you, if I don't know if it's too passionate, but if you speak a certain way, you're too aggressive, you're angry. If, you, um, if you're too passionate, then you're too emotional and Interestingly enough, you mentioned that you don't think that in our societies we've we've you think that we've gotten past the point where we judge a woman, we're willing to vote for a woman. And while we had our first female prime minister elected in 2018, the campaign that was run against her was really based on questions like, is Barbados ready for a female prime minister? Um, is a woman able to lead Barbados? Um, they talked about her hair and a whole, a lot of different things were brought into question. So I think um, spaces like Pink Parliament and other spaces that kind of teach, help girls to learn how to um, embrace their leadership and how to be unapologetic about being strong in what they believe in, but also how to navigate and negotiate um, effectively within spaces that they enter um, is they're really important because I, I think we take for granted how far our society has come, but also still how far we have to go. Okay, um, there's a question here from Zaria. I don't know if you would you wish to comment on Rashana's comment just now before we allow Zaria to ask. Yeah, I was just gonna briefly say, I mean, politics is, is not an easy game, you know? So, so I, um, you know, I, I repeat close unapologetically because I believe that it is ridiculous to expect that, um, you know, notwithstanding Instagram and all of that, you know, that uh, I am going to sort of hold myself up to some standard of wearing something new every time or, you know, some fashion scope. I mean, it's just impossible. There's too much work to be done. And I think that if you sort of get caught up in a in 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 that narrative and that self narrative uh you are going to be criticized that is a part of politics once you are in the public eye you are going to be criticized yes there may be scrutiny placed on us that is different from that of men and uh, you know we, we, i think you know it's changing but it's not changing fast enough you spoke about your um you know the election your last election in barbados i think the questions that you all mentioned you know is barbados ready 
for a woman, et cetera. Those have all been answered clearly. Um, and they were they were answered resoundingly with 30 seats. So <laughs> so you sort of, you know, you mark, you mark the space, you mark the the um the progress, and you move from there. I think it's important to not keep going back to the same narrative and to keep asking the same question because then you allow the society to go back with you. You know, you're here. So where are you going from here? The here is no more. That's the way forward. And you know, and and you know, you, we will really have to find ways to sort of not not aggressively, but answer those questions about you know are you, that focus on the person and the and the aesthetics rather than the work that's being done. And I think that that is actually something that's that's only overcome with the work. It's only ever overcome with the work. So. Zario, can you go ahead and ask your question, please? Hello, good night. How do you think ageism is a factor in women not entering the political arena? And how do you recommend addressing it? Ageism meaning not um, encouraging young people or uh, thinking that women are too old. What, where, where are you seeing the, um, where are you seeing the pendulum swinging? The first one. Young people. Okay, um, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's often in our societies, and again, this is one of the things, so even as we work through, um, you know, women in the space and increasing women, the, the, you know, young people also have uh, challenges in, in creating space or uh, for their voices to be heard. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have used the label ageism, but there does seem to be a predisposition to accepting the perspectives of older people. So maybe it is in fact ageism and you have just attached the label and I just haven't done it yet. Um, so I think that uh, programs, active programs that encourage expressly a space for young people's voices um, are, you know, those are important. Um, one of the things that we put forward uh, in Jamaica was the uh, Youth Advisory Council, which is an open platform. You apply. We have 14 parishes in Jamaica. Um, so we allow for 14 um, persons to be appointed. And it's, you know, you apply online uh, uh, based on your public service, your, you know, your community service rather your um you know your school grades etc to be on a, on this council that actually is asked by the minister it's it actually sits within the ministry of education youth and information um to advise the minister responsible for youth on issues so development of a youth policy for example they're very integral to that is there issues happening on the environment for them to feed in um, that type of space helps build the credibility at, a, at the highest policymaking level and build trust. So um, often these things are trust-based. Uh, you know, uh, they want to know that your view is informed and that it is, um, and, and maybe that's, that's why sometimes there's hesitance, uh, that there is a trust-building factor and a, and a political openness that needs to be fostered. And I think that will only be fostered by concrete programs that allow for the space and allow for young people to demonstrate their abilities. Thank you so much, um, Senator Johnson Smith. Um, ladies and viewers, we are closing. Uh, we're getting ready to close this session. Um, it's been a really informative session. So if there are any final questions, um, you have about five seconds to, to, to put your hand in the air or to type something quickly. Um, but before we go, um, I don't see any questions coming, but my question, my final question would be, um, if you had to give one, one, one set of advice to any young woman who asked you about um, political life, what would it be? I've given a, a fair amount of advice 
<laughs> on this on this call. I'm not sure which one I would elevate to number one, but um, the power of the pen was potent. Yes, yeah. uh, it really and it really does continue to 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 guide me. You know, it it it, it is the distinguishing factor between. A, a political a space and any other. It is that ability to sit in a parliament and change law. If that is what you desire, whether through representative or through the appointed route, um, the power of the pen, if that's what you want, there's only one way to get there. Thank you. Okay, I think that was it, Roshana. Did you see any more in the chat? I think no, in the chat, I, I see somebody here in the chat asking about um, just about specific programs. And I think oh, I spoke about I'm just seeing it. Yes, I don't know, Taito, if maybe you want to in another space because maybe the Zoom thing will, will expire um, to share about the Young Women's Leadership Initiative and about, yes. um, you know, uh, gender equity policies at the um, student council level you know, where they seek to have in the student council executive, they try to have a balance so that you start to sensitize from that point, not only women in leadership, but this this openness to space, to there being enough space, mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, a sort of power struggle. It's about there being space enough for us, all of us at the table. So, agreed. maybe share some more. Okay. Um... I think that may have been the last question or comment. I want to thank everyone who came and who participated, who listened so attentively, who asked questions. Thank you so much, Minister, for joining us. Thanks so much for the engaging conversation. We really appreciate the time that you took to come and have such a fruitful conversation with all of us. We definitely, um, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone. We definitely learned quite a lot and it was really, really insightful. And um, on behalf of the University of the Western is Open Campus. Thank you so much again. And hopefully you'll be able to join us face to face at some point in time. We don't know when. And um, Roshana, I know I'll just allow you to have the last word on behalf of Pink Parliament. And I will leave it there. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for having um, me. Thank yes. you so much. So I want to thank you, Taito. So I want to echo to statement, um, Minister Johnson Smith. I have been following avidly, and I know some of the girls of Pink Parliament and other young women that I know across the region have been following your your profiles and the work that you've been doing as minister in your ministry avidly for quite a while. Um, it is definitely an honor to be able to engage you in this manner, and it's, I'm so grateful, and we're so grateful, myself, Ronald King. Um, and other members of the team that you took this time to, to engage with us and speak to us. Um, regardless of how many women that we speak to, um, there's always something new to learn. Um, I definitely take away your words about the power of the pen and the importance of shaping your message to engage other people because sometimes we forget that women aren't a one-size-fits-all group. Um, so I want to thank you once again, continuously on behalf of all the Pink Parliamentarians. I see a few of them saying um, thanks to everyone on the panel and thank you to the Minister for engaging us this afternoon. Um, and I also want to wish you, um, not least too much up to chat. So I wish you the very best on behalf of Pink Parliament on your future endeavors. I hope that you're able to join us physically at some point in time. Like I said, we do not know when, but I definitely know that tonight has been an honor and a privilege to speak to you and we look forward to doing it again thank you so much mm -hmm. thank you for having me thank you very much and and so you're taking the power of the pen and i'm going to take luck luck leads too much to chance so i'm wishing you the very best i love that it's very elegantly yeah. said so i'm going to own that one for free if you let me and I'll let you have the power <laughs> of the pen for free too <laughs> <laughs> even trade <laughs> okay and you have several thank yous in the chat oh so, lovely and thank you guys best. thank you for engaging and i just encourage you just do you do what works mm -hmm. for you um you know if you whether you're somebody who takes up a lot of space or you lead a little more from a, a place of res reserve um it's fine do you 
if you want the power of the pen, there's one place to find it <laughs> at Parliament. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So take care, everyone, and thanks for your engagement. I hope Thank you, you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Take care, Taiku. Okay. Bye, Roshan. Nice to meet you.